and Father, we just thank you and we praise you. God, we are humbled by your presence. We declare and decree, Heavenly Father, that this is holy ground. God, we declare and decree also that this is not only holy ground, Heavenly Father, but we, because it is holy ground, it is off limits to the enemy. We bind all distractions, Heavenly Father. Anything, Heavenly Father, plead the blood of Jesus over this technology that it will work flawlessly, God. God, remove me from all things, God. Speak to your people, Heavenly Father. Use this word. Make it be clear and understandable, Heavenly Father, in all ways, God. We will continue to lift you. Have your way in the service. Continue to direct the path, Heavenly Father. This is your space. We are just humbled by it, God. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last week, Elder Rhonda started her teaching on believing before seeing. So, this week, I want to talk a little bit more on being before seeing. So being means the quality or the state of having existence. When it comes to identity, y'all, we family, right? (laughs) When it comes to identity, we often have a hard time embracing our true identity and its characteristics before we achieve the tangible title. Often we rush to get to the benefits while avoiding the responsibilities. For example, If somebody is planning to be an executive and a CEO in a company, they know that when they're in the call center. They act like a CEO. They talk like a CEO. That's how they portray themselves. So what happens is they show the attributes. They show the leadership skills. They show how to manage a team, how to create results, and then they get the title. The challenge is What we have to learn for ourselves is being a leader means that we have to have the qualities of a leader before we actually get the title of a leader. So for my little disciples, you have to demonstrate the qualities of a good student, a good athlete, or a good artist, or whatever it is that you wanna be, you have to demonstrate that first before you earn the title of what that is. So with that, I'm gonna jump right into our scripture today. I'll be coming from 1 Kings chapter 17, eight through 16. It was funny because I was actually researching something else and God just makes something just jump off the page to you. Then the world, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, and this is Elisha that he's speaking to, arise and go to Zareph, Zarephath. I've been working on that word all day, (laughs) which belongs to Sidon and dwell in and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, gates y'all, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And she was going to get it. He called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. She said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord of Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends the rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. So just to give you a little background, earlier in chapter 17, verses one through seven, Elijah was in a rough spot. Um, King Ahab had came to power, and if you missed it, King Ahab is the husband of Jezebel. They don't like God. They worship Baal, they want to tear down temples, they want to kill all the prophets. 
So God told Elijah to go tell him that until he get his stuff right or until God speaks, there's going to be a drought. So he said that and he hid. <laughs> he hid in a cave for a while and basically to keep him safe. And after hiding for a time, God told him to come out and go to uh, Zarephan, Zarephath. Uh, the interesting thing about this city is that the name of the city is actually called Refinery. So he's going to be refined in this city, but when he arrives, God sends him, and he indeed, as God said, finds a widow at the city gates gathering sticks. Following God's direction, he asked the widow for some water and bread. So let me point out, the prophet just asked her for some water and bread, and her reply is, so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. See, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. So just to be sure we're on the same page, <laughs> God already deposited a purpose on this woman's life. Wow. He told Elijah, I commanded a woman to feed you and take care of you. But when the prophet arrived to pull on that purpose, he met resistance because her emotions or her feelings. For my little disciples, let's talk about this in one of my favorite books. It's a book called, and I mentioned this in a sermon a while back, but it's a book called The Day the Crayons Quit. By the way, parents at home, the guy who played um, in Beauty and the Beast, he played Gustan's best friend. He's also the voice of Olaf. He reads this book for a story time. So if y'all need something to do during the week, um, y'all can pull this up and it actually will read the audio book on YouTube to the kids. But So in this children's book, The Day the Grands Quit, a little boy named Duncan is at school and it's part of the day where he gets to color. He reaches to his desk for his crayons, but instead of getting crayons, he finds a stack of letters from the crayons. Each crayon has written a letter about why they aren't going to color anymore. So we have, let's start off with the red crayon. The red crayon says, you make me work harder than any other crayon. I even work on holidays. I gotta call, color Santa's red suit. I gotta color the red hearts on Valentine's Day. Man, you just, I gotta do a lot of work. So for me, what I, God was showing me is how often do we as his saints come to him and say, God, you use me too much. God, you know, I even had to minister to somebody on my vacation. You knew I was going on vacation, Jesus. I wasn't going to do nothing. I was going to take off my hat and I was just going to kick back and relax. And here I am ministering to a housekeeper. You said it was my break. And here's the other part. We don't, I still work on holidays. We at church on Resurrection Sunday and Christmas and Passover. And some of the fun holidays we don't even get to do. God, come on now. This is a lot. I mean, it's a prayer and I'm cool with that. But you mean, I mean, I can't get an Easter basket? I can't even get a basket. What's wrong with a basket? It just got some chocolate in it. And Halloween, I mean, I can't even put on my costume. I promise I'm just going to be an angel or a superhero. But I just want to get some candy, Jesus. I don't understand why I got to do all of this. Does it really take all that? Do I really need to pray every day? Do I need to come to all the Bible studies? I came to three out of four. I think that's good. God, you're making me work a whole lot right now. But on a side note for our little disciples and as we talk to them through about the holidays as well, I've always explained it as this. As a parent, when I go to a doctor's office, they tell me about a vaccine and they tell me that it reduces the likelihood of my child getting sick. That there's a possibility that this thing can stop my child from contracting a deadly disease. When I go to the schools and I decide what school my child goes to, I make decisions because if this one can give them a little leg up, if the teachers are a little bit better, if the curriculum is a little bit more, I will pay for a preschool that costs a little bit more if it will give my child an advantage. So, if I have gone through so much in my life 
If you tell me that telling them that I will go to the store and buy you some candy and not make you put on a costume and walk up and down the streets will relieve them from the spirit of poverty, Hallelujah. will break them from having to deal with the fear that I had with Freddy Krueger jumping out the street with some teenage boy or fear. If I can take that possibility, something that I can do can take that away from them, from experiencing some of the hurt and the pain, then I think it's worth it. We invest in so many other ways, and we try to give our kids an advantage in so many other ways. Why not try to give them an advantage spiritually by not even allowing those things to attach themselves to them? All right, I'm going to get off my soapbox. <laughs> I'll come back. So that's our friend, the red crayon, who does so much. Then we have our purple friend, the purple crayon. And he says to Duncan, you don't color inside the lines. Your very neat friend, Purple Crayon. He doesn't like that Duncan goes out the side, side the lines. There are lines there and we need to follow them. This is where God's plan does not always go according to our plan. And God isn't going outside of the lines. He's going outside of our lines. That he isn't going to be restricted by our expectations and our boundaries and what we want to do. We have to go outside. He said, you're going to go outside. I'm going to make you uncomfortable. Then we have our friend, Mr. Beige. He was very upset. Mr. Beige is tired of being number two to Mr. Brown. I think I can be used more. Why am I always used for just the wheat? I have better, I can do more. <laughs> and God was showing me with us sometimes our way of saying and being Mr. Beige is, I'm tired of being in training. When will it be my turn? I'm tired of always being the assistant. I'm always of being there just to help. I want to lead the next event. I want to lead the next thing. I want to start this new ministry. I want to go out and do stuff. But we are so tied up in what we want to do. We have never asked God how he wants to use us and preparing us for the thing that he is going to use us for. Then we get to my friend, Mr. Gray, the Gray Crayon. He's upset because Duncan uses him on the big animals. He wants to color little stuff. Elephants, rhinos, and hippos take up too much of the page, use too much of me, and I need to color something small like a little bunny rabbit. This is where we get to the point where we say, God, I'm tired of you using us for big stuff. Can I start with something? I promise you this was just me and God. Nothing, nobody, no, I don't. God, why can't I just do mission work right here? Why you call me to go all the way to Tijuana, Mexico? Why you call me to go all the way to Israel? Jesus, there's a homeless dude right here on the corner. I go make him a sandwich. I don't need a passport. I don't raise no money. I ain't got to get up at 530 in the morning and stand at the gate of the fair. I'm just going to go down to the little homeless shelter, take them some sandwiches and some bottled water, and we cool, right? Why you want me to use me on something so big? Then we go to my other friend, the white crayon. He's the, his issue is that no one ever sees him. God, I can't. <laughs> I don't even know what just happened. But the white cred, he's always upset because when he's used, no one ever gets to see what he does. And with that, sometimes God shows us that when we look at stuff, we say, I can't do that job. You know that I'm called to minister to people. I'm supposed to be with the people. Clearly, I can't do that if I'm stuck behind a computer or in an office. You know, I could go to the meetings, but, you know, I will be better served when there's people there and I can minister them because something in us wants to be seen. We want people to see the work and the ministry that we're doing. Then we have the black crayon. The black crayon is, I don't like being the outline for other colors. If you are any of the controller personalities, you occasionally feel this way. <laughs> you don't want to, God, why do I always have to be the responsible one? Why do I have to set the boundaries? 
Why do I have to make sure that everybody else, can I just show up and leave? Can I just be there? Can I just come and eat? Do I got to cook the food, serve the food, plate the food, box the food up? I just want to come grab a plate and go home. Then we got green. Green is my, I love some green. Green says, I really like my job. I really do, Duncan. I love being green. I love the alligators. We homies. I like the grass. I like, we good. But if you could just help me out with this one thing. So yellow and orange have been fighting for a minute to the point where they ain't even talking no more. So you didn't hear it from me, but I just want to let you know that yellow and orange are fighting. But I like you though, we cool. But I just, if you could like work with them because they've been arguing, now they ain't talking and it's making stuff hard for me to get things done. So I just wanna let you know. So then you have yellow. Yellow says, the reason yellow and orange are fighting is because they can't agree. They both feel like they're supposed to be the color of the sun. When he colors in his coloring book, that's the, the sun is supposed to be either yellow or orange and they can't agree. That's where the fight is over. Yellow tells you, says, you need to tell Orange that I am the color of the sun. I can prove it because last Tuesday you told me to color the sun and your Happy Farm coloring book on page seven. Then Orange comes back, first of all, I already see that Yellow talked to you. <laughs> but anyway, I want to let you know that I am the color of the sun because on Thursday in your day at the zoo coloring book, you use me. With these particular ones and that what we're going through is, and God shows it is, those moments where we are like, God, back in 19, oh, no, we'll go back and be like, remember in 2012 when we had that conference, it was prophesied over me that I was going to go to many nations. So I gotta go to many nations. I'm the one who's supposed to be on the head of that trip. But then Orange is saying, uh-uh, last year when I was at the retreat, the prophet came and told me I was going to be over many nations. Y'all know there's a lot of nations, right? <laughs> nations, there's a lot of them. We don't need to. But then we have Blue. Blue says, I love being your favorite color and that you use me so much. But I'm now worn down and I can't, I'm, I'm a little piece of Blue. I'm, I can't do anything else because I'm so worn out. How about this? You just let me take a break, God. I can't color no more. Just put me in, just set me to the side and let me take a break because you color with me so much that I'm so worn down, I'm just a little nub of a crayon and I can't do nothing else. Pink is funny because it says you haven't used me in, in the past year. Is it because you don't think I'm the right color? Do you think I, you don't think you can use me? I'm here, use, I, but that's okay. And just Pink gets an attitude because he ain't being used, but he wants stuff to be a different color and you need to use Pink more often. And finally, my last and my favorite one is Peach. Peach, with this particular scenario, Duncan pulled off the wrapper and he says, I'm too embarrassed to come out. For us, this is God. Why did you expose me? Why did you pull my mask off? I can't come out the box now because you, you poked that soft spot. You pulled that out of me. You exposed me. You made me be who I'm supposed to be. So you know what? I'm mad at you, God. I'm just going to sit back. I'm not even coming out now because you made me too vulnerable. The takeaway on this is that Elijah was able to help the woman move beyond her fears and her feelings in verse 13 and 14. But the thing is, when I went through the crayons, I just wanted to talk about in our minds, we look at this woman and say how, so often we read the stories in the Bible and be like, how can you have a prophet of God come before you? How can some of you even see God and be in his actual presence and you still doing something different? But the thing is, it's so easy to say that until we have those experiences and we realize how many times God is trying to do stuff in our lives. As Apostle was saying, we were moving, God is moving us to the things we can't see. We are moving to those things we are being, but to be able to move from one place to another, we got to get past. Once we break off the chains of the enemy, we bind him, we make him powerless and operative and effective, we still have to step out of the jail. We have to move away from the chains. They're broken. They're on the ground. 
And we're entering into a season where once we get loose, you got to move. You can stay in the jail if you want, but God is saying, I just set you free. All you have to do is move. Hmm. The way Elijah helped him or helped her get the widow get away from this is she said, or he says in verse 13, and Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said and make a small cake for it from, or from it first and bring it to me and afterwards some for yourself and your son. So he goes on to say that basically you're going to be fine. Just follow what God said. It's okay. And I get it. I can only imagine with this widow, she doesn't even have a name. She's just the widow. So you have to understand, she lost her husband. She has a young son, so it must have been recently. Her husband is gone. She's mad at God. She doesn't have her provider. The, the country's going through a drought. She's like, forget it. I'm just going to give up right now. And she got so in her feelings, she didn't see the blessing that was right before her. And even in this season, we can do the same thing. We have COVID going on. People are panicking. The laws are crazy. You might have lost your job. And if you still have a job, you might not be excited about being there right now. Just because everything's going so many different ways. And for some people, the enemy is trying to tell them, you know what? It's better just to lay down and die than to deal with this anymore. You don't have to watch the news. You have fear. You have anxiety. And these things are taking over people to the point to where when God does show a blessing right in front of them, they don't even see it because they're so wrapped up and they're trapped by the, the emotions have overtaken them. But in order to move forward in the purpose that God has for us, we must do the following. The first is believe. To consider, believe means to consider to be true. We have to believe God. In Hebrews 11, one through three, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained good testimony. By faith we understand the world were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. So God spoke it. You couldn't see his words, but the evidence of it was there. So I only have one visual, and it's not that bad, I promise. So it sounds so simple, and this is where I love our little disciples, because they believe. Earnestly, wholeheartedly believe. We say we believe. Here's the deal. I can say I believe this is a chair, but I cannot believe in this chair. I can believe it enough to know that it's there and it's an object in my way, but if I don't fully believe, if I don't sit on it, then I don't believe in this chair. If I never try it out, if I never give it an opportunity to support me, then I don't believe in this chair. I don't believe that it exists. I can say it, I can see, ooh, it's nice. I can throw a coat on it. But there's a level of belief that comes when I actually take a scene in it. I allow the chair to support me. I believe that it can hold me. And I know that it will continue to hold me as long as I sit in it. With our faith in God, we have to continue to believe. Not that he's just in the Bible, not that he's just a story, but he truly is our provider. That he really is our healer. That he really can. Miracle signs and wonders. We really have to believe it. Not think about it, sing about it, wonder about it, but truly believe that we serve an awesome God. So... Our first word was believe. Second, we need to exalt God above all. But in Matthew 6, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. One of the things I pray in the morning, and if you're on the line, you've heard me say it. I will praise God above COVID-19. I will praise him above my job. I will praise him above any diagnosis. I will praise him over any phone call or obstacle. I will not let anything in my life take any glory and honor away from him. 
So often we complain and we talk about the devil, but if you think about it, how much time, how much space, how much energy do you give to the devil? Here's the thing, the fact of the matter is I can buy and cast out and do all that stuff, but as long as I exalt God, all that stuff happens naturally. Coachable is the next word. Focus on the goal. Allow God to determine the process. So OC was watching the draft. And one of the things that's really important when people are going to different teams is who the coaches are. And they talk about what team they came from. Here's the thing is, the athletes are good. They're fast, they're strong, they can throw, they can catch, they have great coordination. But it takes a coach to look at the process and to groom them, to see where their flaws are, where their strengths are, what they can do better. In John 21, one through six, we said, it says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were there. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Then said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the, movie, when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered to him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were able to draw it in, were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. We have to be coachable in this season because what if they just told Jesus, no, nah, we got this. I was a fisherman, my daddy was a fisherman, my two uncles were fishermen, we got this, we don't need this. They would have still been sitting out there. But they have to say, you know what, maybe he knows something. Let's give it a try. But to be able to receive that and see that change can happen. Overcome disappointments. As we continue to become and being, we have to overcome the disappointments. We can't let them overcome us. In Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are in the accordant, are called according to his purpose. Especially now, in this season, with everything is going on, we cannot get lost in the disappointment. We have to understand the lesson from it, to see what God is doing in it, how he's moving in it, and move on. But we can't be stuck in that area. The next one is, master your now, because it dictates your next. So often people want to skip to the next one. I'm horrible at it, I play games on, on my phone, and I hate when I get stuck at a level. I just wanna to move to the next level and it doesn't let me. So I have to complete a level before it lets me go to the next one. In Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, it says, for I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call, me, call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me. And when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. Trust that you are more than what you are right now. The next one is embrace the lessons learned. In Exodus 17, eight through 13, it says, now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidimim, and Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out. Fight with Amalek tomorrow and I will stand on top of the hill and the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses raised his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. And so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. 
and his hands were steady until going down to the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. They had to notice that something worked and when it doesn't, embrace the lesson. He could just be like, man, I'm tired. I don't wanna raise my arms no more. It's done, forget it. We just, we'll go to the next battle. But he didn't. He learned what the lesson was, and they adapted to it. The reason this title of the sermon is Being Before Seen is so often we have to see what it is that God has called us to do. As the apostle says, we have to see the promises of God, and we have to be that. If God has called you to be a CEO, act like a CEO. Talk like one. You're gonna show up on time. You're gonna have your work is gonna be precise and together. You're gonna manage team. You're gonna be a great leader. Even before your business card says that, you should live that. If you are called to be a leader, it's amazing because people keep trying to surprise. Uh, mothers will are hard to surprise. We know our kids even before they do. So when our child becomes a leader, we knew that. They was leading teddy bears. They was leading the preschool class. We was getting phone calls about them and how they influenced others. We ain't surprised. But at this point, they don't know that. But we see the potential in them. So the thing that we strive for our little disciples and all of you guys, we want you to live like we already know you will. We see the potential. We know that it's there. So we're going to go ahead and claim it. For our little disciples, we know that you guys are smart, that you have leadership skills, that you are athletic, that you are artistic and creative. So what's happening during this time is, I pray that in every household we are building that up, that we are speaking that to existence. So when you go back to school, I'm sorry to tell all of y'all, you are going to be different from preschool on to high school and into college. Y'all different, and you will be different, and that's okay, because the thing is, we are teaching you to live how you're going to be. We are teaching you to live in prosperity. We are teaching you to live in good health. We are teaching you to be whatever it is that God has called you to be. And even for ourselves as adults, we have to remember that we deserve to become God's promise and refuse to accept anything less. So as I conclude today, Continue as part of becoming, we have to be what we are before we even see it, before people call us that. It's amazing when you look back through the Bible, there's moments where David is a prime example. He was anointed king before he even ever got the title. There were so many people that were anointed and called, and it was usually in a small room with maybe one or two witnesses. And it wasn't till years later, generations later even, that they actually had that title. But along the way, God prepared them every step of the way. He showed them how to fight the battles, how to use wisdom, how to follow him, and how to fight the enemy effectively. So when God appointed a king, he ruled and they ruled effectively and efficiently because they were a, a leader after God's own heart. So as we're going through, don't let our feelings, our emotions, the things in front of us, or even other people, change our feelings and stop us from receiving the blessings that's right in front of us. I always joke that I have, um, God is still working on my control issues, praise him. But I never liked when someone has the ability to walk in the room, and this is especially for my teenagers on the line. I do not like it when someone else has the ability to walk in the room and change my mood. If you have the ability to walk in a room and make me mad, make me cry, you have the ability to steal my joy because you, you just walked in the room, I don't have dominion over that space and I got a problem with that. I wanna have control. My God is going to have control in this space. So I always, I. Some of y'all know, I don't like it when you said she made me mad. They looked at me that way. Your look means nothing compared to my God. I have worked too hard to get this joy. And I'm not going to let somebody in a classroom, in a workspace, in a cubicle take that away from me. So 
so often we get up because somebody can do that and we'll change our whole mindset. We can have a blessing right in front of us, but we in a bad mood. We all snappy. We got an attitude because somebody walked in the room or somebody called us. We didn't even answer the call. Lord, they name just showed up on our phone and we just in a mood all day. You might as well done took the call. You done played through the whole conversation. Well, she was going to say that and I was going to say this. And so I was going to tell her this anyway. So I didn't need to answer the phone because I already knew what was going to happen. No, you didn't. You just, why are you going to let somebody else change you? They don't have dominion. That's witchcraft. That is witchcraft. And I refuse to be a part of it. So as we continue to go through and God is moving you, let that stuff go. If you got to forgive them, forgive them. Do what you got to do, but don't let another human have that kind of power over you. That they get to change who you are. They get to change your personality. They get to change your mood and how you feel, how your day goes. There ain't another person on this earth that's going to dictate my day like that. So you have to, so as we go forward and be, be open to the things that God is doing and making sure that we, we aren't trapping our own selves and the things that is coming around us. We done broke free from the enemy, so we got to make sure that we don't lock our own selves back up. So we are going to live, I declare and decree on this day, Heavenly Father, that we will live like what you have called us to be. You said your word cannot return back to you void. So we won't return back to you void, Heavenly Father. So on today, if you are online and you don't have a church home, hey, we here. <laughs> we are who we are. Um, and we are excited to um, be here for you. Um, if you are in need of prayer, please reply back to the announcements email. Um, and either a leadership person or someone from the KIPP team or our intercessory prayer can reach out to you. Or um, we will continue to lift you up during our prayer time in the morning. Um, and if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please, please, please reach out to us and we will uh, be in contact with you. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we praise you on this day. God, we are humbled by the fact that you declare and decree that your word shall not return to you void. We are your word, God. You spoke us into existence. So, God, we will fulfill, our children will fulfill, our family will fulfill the promises that you declared and decreed over them. God, we repent for any time we let anybody else come in and take away your space, your joy, anything, the gifts that you gave us, God. And God, we are thankful for you showing us how to be free, God. How to become the men and women of God that you have called us to. God, before the world sees it, you know it, God. So we thank you and we praise you for how you are moving in our lives, Heavenly Father. And we will continue to be, if we haven't either continue or will begin to be the men and women, the royalty, the royal priesthood, Heavenly Father, the ch children of a most high king, God, we will act, walk, talk, be what you have called us to be and who we are. We just thank you so much, Heavenly Father. Continue to be with us for those who have to travel as we depart from this place, but not your presence, God. And continue to be with those online, Heavenly Father, as they continue to, to worship and praise in their home. We plead the blood of Jesus over their homes, Heavenly Father, that nothing can draw nigh their dwelling place, God. So we just thank you and we praise you, and in Jesus' name, amen.